thing this afternoon. Please, everyone, come in for uh, session two. And it's on how slash why, how and why really the same thing, if you ask me. But how slash why does this universe come to exist? Okay. And our first speaker is someone who is not here today. Uh, uh, Michael Heller, unfortunately, can't be with us today, but his, we have a video of his um, lecture uh, today. And so um, he's a, a distinguished professor of uh, philosophy at the Pontifical Academy of Theology in Krakow. Um, he's written on uh, relativity, he, on cosmology, and he was a Templeton Prize winner in 2008. Um, do we have a title for his talk, Priya? Uh, or? It's, it's a talk on the topic of this conference. And so, um, so I'm going to give, the, now, uh, showing my, my massive powers, I will point and then the lecture will begin. Okay? No, so, here we go. Scale if a theory made a 
as many correct individual predictions as, say, the general theory of relativity or the quantum theory of life, without what that theory says about the fundamental structure of the universe being correct, or essentially, or basically correct. The only difference between my standpoint and that of Warhol's is the difference in emphasis. Warhol puts an accent on predictions, whereas I emphasize the method within which the predictions are possible. A good starting point for our analysis is Quine's famous criterion of existence. The question he faced was, which ontological commitments does the given language enforce on its user? His celebrated answer is encapsulated in the short formulation. To be is to be the value of the variable. This means that the theory is committed to those and only those entities to which the bound variables of the theory must be capable of referring in order that the affirmations made in this theory be true. Although in this particular place, Quine speaks about mathematical theories, his idea remains valid if the theory is replaced by any statement formulated in a language capable of being logically analyzable. And the goal of such an analysis is to disclose ontological commitments of a given statement. We look to bound variables in connection with ontology not in order to know what there is, but in order to know what a given remark or doctrine, ours or someone else's, says there is. And this much is quite properly a problem involving language. Physical theories are expressed in a language. And Quine's criterion of existence refers to them as well. In fact, Quine, in his essay, makes many references to physical theories. However, the language of physics is very peculiar. To be precise, we should speak about the peculiar languages of various physical theories rather than about the language of physics as such. The language of a given physical theory consists of a text and mathematical formula. And both these elements are essential. In more advanced physical theories, the content of the theory is contained in its formula. And the text provides an interpretation without which the formula were at most a part of mathematics. If we aspire to conduct an analysis a la Quine, we should look for bound variables in both these layers of the language, in mathematical formula and in the text. And this, of course, would make the analysis more complicated, but still in principle possible. This would give us knowledge not about what there is, but rather about what a given theory says there is. In practice, we could use a simplified version of this approach, which I would call an exegesis of the mathematical structure of a given physical theory. To see what I have in mind, let us distinguish three types of comments or interpretations of a physical theory. First, an interpretation could be inconsistent or even contradictory with the mathematical structure of the theory. For instance, Bergson's interpretation of special relativity 
is in fact contradictory with the mathematical formulas of this theory. In 1922, Bergson wrote a book entitled Durée Simultaneité, Duration and Simultaneity, in which he claimed that Einstein gave false interpretation of his own theory. In fact, it turned out that it was Bergson who misunderstood mathematical formula of the special theory of relativity completely. And in this sense, his interpretation of the theory is inconsistent or even contradictory with the mathematical structure of this theory. The second kind of interpretation is when the interpretation is a neutral with respect to the mathematical structure of the given physical theory. For instance, the space-time of special relativity can be, can be interpreted as a block universe, that is to say as a totality of existing all at once, or it can be interpreted as now moving forward in time. Both these interpretations can be reconciled with the mathematical structure of the theory, although the block universe seems to be in a sense more natural. And that interpretation could so closely follow the structure of the physical theory that any of its perturbation or modification would result into inconsistencies or contradictions with the theory's formulas. This I call exegesis of the structure of this theory. And a good example is provided by the interpretation of theorems on the geodesic incompleteness of space-time as space-time singularities. In the 60s of the previous century, a series of theorems was proved by mm, several people uh, who which established geodesic incompleteness, incompleteness of some space-times under certain conditions. And uh, this incompleteness was interpreted in terms of the existence of singularities in a given space-time. This is a good example of an exegesis of the mathematical structure. This is a very natural and, I would say, straightforward interpretation. Such an exegesis is a practical way, and often unconsciously done by physicists, a practical way of disclosing what a given theory says there is. Such an exegesis is nothing else but a simplified version of the analysis a la quoi. But in interpreting physical theories, we should go beyond quine. Let's again quote from quine. We commit ourselves to an ontology containing contain numbers when we say there are prime numbers larger than a million, we commit ourselves to an ontology containing centaurs when we say that there are centaurs, and we commit ourselves to an ontology containing Pegasus when we say Pegasus is. To which ontology do we commit ourselves when we practice physics? I do not have in mind any particular physical theory or model, but rather physics as such. By asking this question, we are going beyond quine, since we are leaving a, rel a relatively secure domain of logical linguistic analysis. Nevertheless, we can learn from quine to look for those elements without which doing physics would be impossible. We should look for such elements in the very method of physics. If it would be a miracle on a cosmic scale, provided theories such as the general theory of relativity or the photon theory of light were so successful without being basically true, 
then the success of the physical method without its reference to what there is should be qualified as a coincidence on the mega cosmic scale. Successes of all particular physical theories hang on these ontological commitments of the method. How should we then identify the ontological commitments of the method of physics? To do this in a precise way, at least partially, paralleling the preciseness of Quine's approach, we would certainly go beyond the limits of the present talk. But on the other hand, the method of physics has been subject to so many analyses that to do this in a sketchy way does not seem to be too difficult and is quite sufficient for our purposes. Roughly speaking, a method of physics consists of the following three things. A. A certain mathematical structure. B. A part of the aspect of the world which a given mathematical structure is supposed to model. And C. Bridge rules interpreting A in terms of B. And owing to these rules, A serves as a mathematical model of B. Every particular theory or model is an implementation of this scheme. Also making empirical predictions following from the theory or the model and testing them by confrontation with experimental data is done within the context of this scheme. Independently of it, the entire procedure would have no meaning at all. There is no need to enter now into many philosophical discussions related to the above scheme, such as how do mathematical structure exist, what is the relationship between mathematical structures and mathematical objects, and so on and so forth. All these problems are irrelevant here. What interests us at the moment is what the method of physics says there is. We are not asking about the absolute ontology of reality. We are only looking for the ontology of the university schools of physics and the answer is as follows. There exist mathematical structures, a domain to which they refer, and rules establishing this reference. Without presupposing these three elements, nothing can be done in physics, or even no physics could be possible. In this part of my talk, I shall apply as an example the above interpretational proposal to a physical model. And since we are concerned with the existence problem in physics, I have chosen a model whose authors claim to have mathematically modeled the creation of the universe from nothingness. And this complex one speaks also about the quantum tunneling out of nothingness. The model was published in 1983 by James Hubble and Steve Hawking and later on it was developed by others. In quantum field theory there is a method due to Richard Feynman to calculate the tra transition probability for a quantum system to go from state A to state B. This is not a theoretical subtlety satisfying aesthetic predilections of theoretical physicists, but an essential procedure, a way of computing the dynamical evolution of a quantum system. And to do so, one must take into account all paths 
from the state A to the state B. And to calculate a certain integral along all the, the extremal value of all these integrals is related to the transition probability we want to know. This is Feynman method, which works very well in quantum field theory. The idea of Hubble and Hawking was to transfer the strategy to the conceptual environment of quantum cosmology. But uh, this required a chain of bold hypothesis. A state of the universe is unlike the state in quantum theory that can be visualized as a point in a space called phase space. Hahn and Hawking assumed that the universe is spatially closed and consequently its state at a given time can be represented as a three-dimensional surface of a hypersphere, the so-called three geometry, equipped with suitable quantum fields. All such states of the universe are elements of a space called superspace, which is mathematically much more complicated than the usual phase space in quantum field theory. How to compute all of the possible paths from one such state to another? This is a difficult task both from the conceptual and technical points of view. But Hubble and Hawking showed they must be in dealing with it. In order to overcome some technical difficulties, they introduced a bold innovation, an imaginary time. That is to say, a time that acquired all properties of a fourth space dimension. All this, together with some other important simplified assumptions, served to calculate the probability for the universe to find itself in the state B, provided it was previously in the state A. The standard tool for calculating probabilities in quantum theory is the wave function. And the wave function is defined on the space of state. Here, in the context of quantum cosmology, it must be defined on the sub superspace of all possible states of the universe. And uh, is called the wave function of the universe. It is another investment of the Hubble Hawking model that is involved in some conceptual problems, but it is indispensable for calculating transition probabilities. Hartle and Hawking went a step further. Let us assume that the state A is empty. No geometry, no three geometry, no quantum fields. What is the possibility for the universe to find itself in the state B if there was no state A? Not only these questions turn out to be meaningful, but the calculated probability for such a transition from a null state to state B could be different from zero. And exactly this allows us to speak about the quantum creation of the universe from nothing. And now we should ask which are the ontological commitments of the Hartle Hawking method. To answer this question, we put aside the future developments of this model and the criticism it provoked, and take into account the model as it was presented by Hubble and Hawking in the original paper. Of course, 
the precise analysis of acquiring should go into many technical details, which cannot be done in this talk. We must be satisfied with a rather superficial account of the problem, which, however, should be enough to grasp the main idea. What does the model say there is? Two levels of existence should be distinguished in it. The first level is that of potential existence. And the, and the potentialities in this model are severely limited by many factors. The wave function of the universe must be a solution to a differential functional equation called the Witt-Wheeler equation. Moreover, to overcome some technical difficulties, Hartman and Hawking consider only a small subspace of the superspace called mini superspace. Everything that goes beyond this limitation does not have even a potential existence in this model. A second level of existence is the actual existence. And this is a delicate question. Since the model is a quantum model, probabilities in it play the essential role. To states of the universe before they are instantiated, we can only ascribe probability of coming into existence. And in this sense, the model's ontology admits a situation in which there is different from zero probability for some states of the universe to emerge from a non state. At least one such possibility has been realized and this is why the universe actually exists. We should not forget, and this is important, that we always refer to the universe as an element of the model and about its existence as presupposed by the model in the sense of Aquine. Whether this model corresponds to reality, that is to say, to which degree it is verified experimentally, this is quite another story. And now we should go beyond the analysis of Aquine and ask about the ontological commitments of the method of physics on which the hartle hawking model is based. In agreement with what was said in the previous part of my talk, the model must assume everything without which the method of physics cannot work. That is to say, it must assume certain mathematical structure that is interpreted as a structure of the physical world, or some of its aspects. One says sometimes that the model presupposes certain laws of physics, and we may adopt this way of speaking as a simplifying convention without going into a dispute concerning the status of physical laws, the semantic denotations and so on. In the case of the hartle hawking model, three collections or systems of physical laws, that is to say mathematical structures equipped with suitable interpretations, are assumed. Firstly, laws taken from quantum field theory, such as Feynman path integrals of the method of calculating probabilities with the help of wave function. Secondly, the laws taken from general relativity, for instance, everything related to closed cosmological models, and some approaches to quantum gravity, such as the Witt Wheeler equation. Finally, some new mathematical tools suitably interpreted, for instance, imaginary time, that have turned out to be indispensable to make 
that are two kinds of laws work together. together. The Harvey Hawking quantum creation model is ontologically committed to the existence of these three systems of physical laws. Without them, the model is unthinkable. And now our final question. Is the claim of Hubble and Hawking justified that they have succeeded in constructing a moral quantum creation of the universe from nothing? Assuming that their model is both mathematically and physically correct, and taking into account our Paraguayan analysis, we are entitled to say that in their model there is indeed a different from zero probability of the process of an emergence of the universe from nothingness to occur. But what does it mean nothingness in this context? Let us notice that in the mathematical structure of the model there is nothing, and rightly so, that could be interpreted as nothingness. Nothingness is outside of the model. In this sense, nothingness is what the model says nothing about. <laughs> the Harvard Hawking model is based on a rich mathematical structure equipped with a rich physical interpretation. The model itself, with all its structural elements, quantum creation included, is made out of this physically interpreted mathematical structure, which is far from being nothingness. If we attempted to construct a physical model from absolute nothing, the zero of existence, no mathematical structure, nothing to interpret, we would not be able to move one more step forward. This is why the Leibniz question, why is there something rather, rather than nothing, so persistent? And Leibniz's short comment, for nothing is simpler and easier than something. Nothingness is simpler and easier than something. Why then is there something that is neither easy nor simple? Systems at the uh, University of Cape Town in South Africa, he's a former Templeton Prize winner and uh, distinguished cosmologist. And uh, uh, he'll be speaking to us on the topic of. Uh, why things are the way they are. Why things are the way they are. How does this. Uh, there we go. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be with you all. And I must make a declaration at this point is that I am very, very careful when I'm talking at meetings to explain whether I'm talking as a scientist or talking in what I would call more broadly philosophical terms. Given the structure of this meeting, I'm going to go beyond being a scientist. That doesn't mean that I will in any way contradict what I believe science says, but I'm just making a declaration that I'm going beyond what science says because otherwise we couldn't deal with what this conference is about. So why are things the way they are is what I want to talk about. And it's a very deep, the, the very deep issue which was raised in the conference title is why anything exists at all. Now, I don't think we can answer that question, which is a kind of a <laughs> We have to assume some ground of existence for the universe or for the multiverse, or else we can't begin to get off the ground. So I don't think we can actually say anything about why anything exists. 
We have to view, assume the existence of physical laws or random chaos or purposeful existence or something as a beginning of our structure. And in a sense, that's what Michael Heller was saying as well. We have to have some ground basis from which to start or else we can't start. We can debate what that ground basis is, but we can't ultimately say why this basis exists. And this applies whether you think the laws of physics are the ultimate thing or God is the ultimate thing. You can always ask, why does that thing exist? And in the end, you have to stand, and I think we've heard the theologians say this this morning, you have to stand and say, this is the point where I have to assume this exists, and I can't get anywhere unless I assume that, and that's the point I'm going to take off from. So we can investigate what this ground may be, and that's the ground for existence of the universe at ourselves, but we're going to have to assume something exists in order to even begin. Then, the deep issue in both cosmology and human life is what underlies the existence of the laws of nature, because they define the possibility space within which the universe and life comes into being. You'll see an overlap with what Michael said. I didn't know what he was going to say, and I'm very glad he emphasized also this idea of a possibility space. The, the laws and the possibility space are kind of dual to each other, and in many ways it's better to talk about the possibility space than the laws because one can talk about the possibility space without engaging in the ontologically deep issue, what is the physical, what is the ontological nature of the laws of physics? I'll say a word or two later. So the question is, why do any laws exist at all? And why do they have the nature they have leading to our physical and mental existence? Why do these laws make our life possible? Of course, that's the anthropic question, although I'm not going to deal very much specifically with anthropic issues. Now, we heard earlier today that you need to talk about existence as well as causation. In my view, we've got to take a broad view of existence. We cannot just take a materialist view, even if we are hardcore scientists, we have to admit the existence of both physical and abstract reality. Science, in fact, in my view, cannot proceed without assuming not only that physical things exist, but that abstract things exist. And we've just heard about this, the nature of the physical laws, and Michael put this very nicely. When people talk about the creation of the universe out of nothing or out of the laws of physics, as Stephen has done in his recent book and as Hartland Hawking did, they are assuming, without explaining how, that the laws of physics or something equivalent to the laws of physics pre-exists the coming into being of the physical universe. Now, what is missing in their discussions? They don't tell us where or how or in what way does this mathematical structure and this physical structure pre-exist the coming into being of the universe? But they exist. They do assume it, as we've just heard. Uh, all of these claims of creating the universe out of nothing, so-called, assume, in fact, the laws of quantum physics hold, the laws of group representation theory hold, variation principles hold, you name it. There's a vast structure which somehow or other they assume pre-exists the coming into being of the physical universe. And they never tell us in what space or in what kind of existence these things have before the universe comes into existence. And that, of course, is a great big lacuna in their explanatory stories. Um, I think most physicists actually, whether they say it or not, believe that the physical laws exist and probably that they pre-exist the coming into being of the universe. That, in fact, seems to be what's in Stephen Hawking's latest book, for instance. But another issue is mathematics. Where and when and how does mathematics come into existence? Now, I am one of the people who believes in a platonic existence of mathematics. In other words, I believe that mathematics is discovered, not invented. Uh, Roger Penrose, of course, is someone who's written about this. Uh, various other people have written about, about this. The key point about this is that we discover things by mathematical reasoning that we did not expect and, in fact, did not want to find out. For instance, the square root of 2 is irrational, was discovered by the Greeks 2,000 years ago. They did not want to discover that. It was forced on them by the nature of the mathematical existence. And any mathematician anywhere in the universe who's reached a certain level of competence will find that the square root of 2 is irrational. 
Okay, what that means is that the mathematics. Now, of course, they they can use different number conventions. They can represent it, but nevertheless, in whatever notation they use, they will discover that the square root of two is irrational, that pi is irrational, and so on. What that means is we are discovering the nature of something which is not dependent on humanity. It's not dependent on culture or place or time. So I think the only way, I'm not an expert on Plato or Platonic existence. So in, this, in my <laughs> rough and ready philosophical way, I say to myself, these things exist in a Platonic world. They exist as forms or something before, before the universe come, or comes into existence. Of course, one of the questions Roger has talked about and many others has is that in some sense it looks like physics depends on the mathematics. So this relation between the existence of mathematics and physics is a very deep and difficult one. Roger's written about it for, in his book called The Small, The Big, The Large and The Complex. Oh, I can't remember the title. Okay, so what does it mean if we discover the universe must have had a beginning? Now, on, on the classical theory, it looks like it must have quantum field theory, quantum gravity doesn't make it clear. Actually, in many ways, I think it's philosophically preferable to have a beginning. This is where this debate about infinity comes in. <laughs> How do we handle the idea of creation of the universe and the kinds of pre-existing entities that might have been responsible? Or do we give up on the idea of causation? The, the thing is that what is being attempted in these discussions of bringing the universe into existence, people are using laws which we find to hold within the universe and they're extrapolating them to a situation before the universe existed insofar as that makes sense and trying to use the laws which apply within the universe to talk about how the universe came into, in, into existence. Now that's the most extraordinary extrapolation from within this existence into trying to talk about how that existence came into being. It's a great um, leap of faith. Are there laws for the universe per se? Now one of the problems of course is the uniqueness of the universe. There's only one thing. Now the whole concept of a law is a law is something which applies to many different different objects because it isn't a law <laughs> unless there are different objects which it will tell you about. If there's only one universe it doesn't even make sense to talk about a law. Can you have a law which only applies to one thing? Okay. Now, of course, the response to this, which is being pushed by many, is well, there isn't one thing. There's a multiverse. Um, but this just this doesn't. The multiverse does not solve any ultimate problem. So you just step back and find and say, why is there a multiverse? Why is there is there a law of coming into being of the multiverse? And all of the same problems recur for the multiverse as occurred for the universe. The multiverse does not solve any fundamental ontological uh, philosophical problems. So what's the nature of physical laws and the nature of their existence? I'll say more about that in a moment. But let's get to causation because this is the other part of this. Now, I think that we can see f four different types of causation and you, you can argue with me about this, but I think we can see four different kinds of causation taking place. There's the purposeless algorithms grinding away and giving their results mercilessly without fear or favor, necessity. And this is where the laws of physics come in. One of the enormous discoveries is that underlying all of this complexity around us, there are these laws that just give you an answer in that absolutely um, yeah, purposeless way. Then there's this business of chance, chance and necessity, of course, random events, meaningless making things happen. And you we can have this whole debate about the universe, how much of what happens in the universe is due to chance and how much is due to necessity. Mono's thesis. There is actually, I think, a growing awareness. I'm becoming more and more awareness of how the selection processes, adaptive selection, create order where there was none before. And this is actually, in my view, quite different. I think it's the, this idea of adaptive selection is an incredibly powerful idea and it doesn't only apply to Darwinian evolution and biology. Actually, I've just been writing some papers how that applies in many cases in physics as well and we could talk about that. So adaptive selection is where order is created where there was no order before. It's how you go against the law of entropy. 
And the final kind of thing which certainly occurs in the world, in the universe, is purposeful action related to meaning, ethics, and aesthetics. And this obviously does exist. We're sitting in this room because we wanted to be here. The fact that um, we are here shows that purpose does exist. We're here because we wanted to be here. We had a purpose in coming here. So all of these kinds of causation occur in the universe. The purposes, algorithms, random events. Well, the one you can query is random events. Does that just mean we didn't know enough about it? Is chance a real causal category, or is it just covering up the fact that we didn't have enough data? Okay. Selection processes certainly take place, but of course they're based in the underlying physics, and then purposeful action, there is no doubt whatever that purposeful action takes place. These all occur. And so the question is which is fundamental and which is derivative? Which applies at what scales? Which applies to the universe itself? There are two key issues, and again, Michael just referred to this. First, there's the existence of the possibility space for physical existence, but also for mental existence. There's a possibility space, for instance, for playing football. You can throw a ball in many, many different ways, but you cannot violate momentum conservation or energy conservation. There's a possibility space for biology, the landscape of evolutionary theory. There are some animals that are possible and some that are not. Evolution traces out some, fills up some of the possibility space. Evolution never reaches some of the possibility landscape of animals. But the point is what can happen in evolution is rigidly controlled by that possibility landscape. You cannot get outside it. There actually is also a possibility space for thoughts. Only some thoughts are possible, some are not possible. Why? Because they have to be logically consistent. But much more than that, I will make the following claim, that the place, space of possible thoughts is a finite space. Now, this is where we hit this infinity thing. In. Why is it finite? It's because we live for a finite time. A sentence has to have a start, a beginning, and an end. You cannot have an infinite number of thoughts because to have a thought you have to start having the thought and come to an end of the thought. And our short-term memory only lasts for a certain amount of time. And in fact, you can, act, you can calculate, for instance, how many thoughts a person can have during their lifetime. It's a finite number. The brain has a finite number of connections with a finite number of possible states. Now, it's a very, very large number, but it is finite, not infinite. And so, in fact, there is a finite possible series of thoughts which people can have during the course of a finite lifetime. The same is true for emotions. Um, there's a possibility space for meaning and values. There's certain things which can be sensible meanings and certain that can't. Now, I'm treading on dangerous territory here, but I'm willing to stand up for all of these things. There isn't only just a physical possibility space. A very, very interesting one is what Terence Deacon has written about in terms of language. There's a possible space for semiotic uh, practices that if you're going to have a symbolic system which represents really a, an, an, a, a world out there, the process of symbolism is restricted by certain symbolic rules and it has to obey those rules if it's going to adequately represent the reality out there. So there's a possibility space. But then there's the question of the coming into existence of things that make these possibilities real. Only some of these possibilities are actually realized. The universe itself, matter and energy comes into existence. Well, that was allowed by the laws of physics, which in some sense preceded the universe. But then why did the specific matter and energy actually spring into existence? There's the existence of life, the existence of intelligence, emotion, meaning. What makes the specific laws fly and how do they make these things happen? So the point is you have the possibility space, but then you have the question, what is it which populates that possibility space? And Michael actually mentioned that as well. So we want to understand the existence and nature of causal laws that allow true complexity to come into existence, an evolving universe that leads to stars, galaxies, planets, and life. Now, true complexity arises in modular hierarchical structures, and each of those words is really very important because this is what allows the emergence of complexity. And I could talk about great length about this, but I don't have the time. But I just want to say one thing. Complexity arises first in evolutionary terms. It didn't exist four billion years ago. It does exist now. 
It, it complexity arises in developmental terms. Each of us started our lives less than a hundred years ago. <laughs> we, each of us, we have a developmental time scale of 20 years from when we are born to when we become an adult. And complexity arises in functional terms. Each of us is made out of protons, electrons, and neutrons, which are stuck together in such a way that our brains can function. So there's this extraordinary way in which complexity arises in evolutionary terms, in developmental terms, and in functional terms. Okay? The hierarchy of structure on the physical side is represented there. Particle physics, atomic physics, chemistry, materials, geology, space science, astronomy, cosmology. And the life sciences one, and, well, the human life, particle physics, atomic physics, chemistry, the same as on the other side, biochemistry, cell biology, botany, zoology, physiology, psychology, sociology. We have these, the life sciences hierarchy and the natural sciences hierarchy. The hierarchy is based at the lowest levels in the specific families of particles interacting through four fundamental forces, unified at high energies, based in quantum mechanical principles. Interactions described by variational principles subject to fundamental symmetries entailing conservation laws, specific masses and interaction strengths subject to special relativity locally, but with the exact symmetries broken and all taking in the Romanian space-time. Now what I want to suggest is that each level of the hierarchy complex complexity universal principles apply best thought of in platonic terms. At each level there are laws of behavior, laws that are effective laws at that level. For instance, there are effective laws of chemistry. There are effective laws of nuclear physics. There are effective laws of particle physics. There are laws at each of these levels. Each level exists in its own right, even though it is based in lower levels. And the laws at each level are effective laws deriving from action at the lower level. So I take the view that each level of the hierarchy ontologically exists, that this table exists as a table. The atoms in the table exist as atoms. The protons exist as protons. The fact that it's a table isn't denied by the fact it's made up out of protons as well. The way these higher level laws worked out is shaped by the higher level context in which they act, leading to effective laws at each level that may be thought of as having an ontological reality. The laws of chemistry are real laws. The law of mass action is a real law. The perfect gas laws are real laws. They are based in lower level laws, but they emerge as laws which are the laws which work at that level. They controls what happens at each level in a way independent of time and place, independent of our understanding and descriptions. Now, the reductionist idea of only bottom-up causation just isn't true. It isn't true that in the hierarchy everything proceeds from the bottom going all the way up. Top-down causation takes place as well. I've been spending a lot of time on this. I could talk at great length <laughs> about it if any of you want to catch me about this. But in particular, the human mind has causal powers. Physical laws are not the only form of causation in time. I've already said that. I'm going to emphasize it again. In bottom-up causation, the microforces which determines what happens at the higher levels and are the foundations of the higher level activity at in between each of those levels. So, but top-down action takes place as well. That's when the higher levels causally uh, control what happens at the lower levels in a coordinated way. And there is, in fact, multiple top-down action as well as bottom-up action taking place all the time in all real-world systems. It enables higher levels to coordinate action at the lower levels and so gives them their causal effectiveness by determining their context. It's prevalent in the real physical world and in biology because no real physical or biological system is isolated. For instance, the process of evolution is a top-down process whereby the environment plays a crucial role in what specific genes come into existence and what specific structures of the nucleotides happen in a gene. If you have a bear in the Canadian um, um, forests, it'll have a brown fur. If you have a bear in the polar area, it'll have a white fur. The genes are different because the environment is different. That's top-down action from the environment to the level of the coding of the genes in the animal. And so there's top-down action taking place as well. As I say, I could discuss this at great length. This is an example of the causal power of the human mind. The human mind has led to the deployment of billions and billions of protons and neutrons in a specific plan which was in accord with the way that the human mind planned that aircraft. 
How does complexity arise? At the astronomical scale, gravity causes structures to come in, into being spontaneously, locally apparently against the second law. One of the great paradoxes of the way that gravity works is that nobody has got a proper description of gravitational <laughs> entropy. There are attractors in phase space, which are stars and galaxies, so that there must be a definition of gravitational entropy that makes it okay. This is still not understood. At the everyday life scale, it comes to complexity comes to, to some degree by self-organization, but that's very limited. You've probably all read the stuff about sand piles and self-organizing systems, but the key process is adaptive selection, which requires randomness to create ensemble from which a preferred set is chosen and others discarded. And I want to emphasize one thing. Adaptive selection can be a once-off process. In biology, it gets its power because it takes place time and time again, but that's not necessary to the concept. For instance, in quantum theory, the process of state vector preparation is a process of adaptive selection. Now, if you believe in physical determinism and uh, in relation to life, you have to say if you believe that everything works in a bottom-up way from what was there at the beginning of the universe, what you'd have to say is the speech that I am making at this moment was predetermined by the positioning of the particles at the surface of large scattering uh, in, in the early universe. But this isn't the way the real world works because of quantum uncertainty in the nature of existence. In fact, if you knew everything about the universe at the beginning of the inflationary epoch, you can't predict that this galaxy or this star or this planet will exist because during the inflationary era, quantum fluctuations created the perturbations on the last scattering surface, which then were the seeds for structural formation later on. Now, those quantum fluctuations were by their nature unpredictable, if you believe quantum theory. And so the fact that this planet exists or that our galaxy exists cannot be predicted from if, if you knew everything about what existed at the beginning uh, of inflation. You couldn't predict that our galaxy exists or that this planet exists. You've got to take seriously the fact that this unpredictability takes place. What this means is all of the complex structure we see around us has arisen through its own logic, through bottom-up and top-down causation. It was not preordained by the specific nature of what existed on the last scattering surface. At the bottom, impersonal dynamical principles operating on material entities in space-time are needed for reliable emergence of complex orders of existence, such as galaxies, stars, and planets. So if you're going to have these, you must have reliable laws. This can only happen if there are precisely ordered evolving relationships and processes governing the behavior of the matter at the basic levels. But the question is, why are the physical laws so well described by mathematics? You've all heard this. Now, in fact, at a certain level, this isn't surprising because these are laws which create patterns. Mathematics is the science of describing patterns. That's what mathematics is. So because mathematics describe ordered patterns of relationships, it's not really surprising these relations and processes can be described mathematics because that's the very nature of mathematics. What is surprising is that the fundamental physical relationships can often be described by very simple laws. That's the surprising thing, that those laws are so often so simple, like the inverse square law. And my take on this is that the reason these are simple laws is because the underlying nature of these fundamental laws is geometrical rather than algebraic, that the algebra is describing geometrical properties. And that's what results in them being accurately re represented by simple analytic relations. Because, for instance, geometric conservation of particle fields gives an inverse square law. Parallel transport underlies Young Mills theory, Aharonov, Bohm, Feynman things. These are all geometrical things. This is just an aside for the physicists here. But I want to say something about these mathematical models because we've already heard here how people take these mathematical models so seriously. But you've got to remember what was being said there. You've got your mathematical model and you've got your reality and you've got your bridge principles. And the question is, it doesn't matter how much you love your model, does it in fact describe the physical reality accurately? And if so, when does it describe it accurately? Eddington wrote beautifully about this in his book, The Nature of the Physical World. You've 
can love your mathematical world models, but beware of them because they leave out most of the complexity of what is there. They're trying to get at the core of what is happening. They do that in a most extraordinarily effective way by somehow extracting an essential core of what is going on. But in doing so, they are leaving out almost everything which is going on. So you must be very careful how far you take your understandings based on those mathematical laws. They're highly abstracted. They're very oversimple descriptions of what is going on. So beware models, and particularly remember, they each have a domain of application. Each mathematical model, for instance, Newtonian dynamics, has a domain of applicability. Newtonian dynamics is good on small scales, that is, less than this, or up to the scale of the solar system, or let's say the galaxy, up to the scale of the galaxy, for short times, well, reasonably short times, for not too high energies, not too great gravitational fields, you've got to be very, very careful that when you apply these laws that you respect the domains within which those laws are applicable. So don't fall in love with those laws and believe that they are more real than reality. At the fundamental law, the question is, what's the nature of existence? Are these laws prescriptive? Is there somehow a space of laws? Is Maxwell's equation somehow written up in some platonic realm from which it prescribes how electrons and photons interact with each other? If so, where is the space? In what way do these laws exist in some platonic space grabbing hold of reality? That would be, in, in some sense, be a mathematical description. It would, show, it would precede the existence of the universe, as I've already mentioned. But there's another view that these laws are not prescriptive, they're descriptive. They simply happen to describe how things happen. And it's just good luck that we can use these laws to describe them. And these two views are in competition with each other. I think most physicists tend to believe the first one, although they don't make that explicit. The problem with the second one is if the laws are descriptive, why is it that electrons and protons billions of miles, billions of light years away over there on the last scattering surface behave the same way as the ones over there. If it's purely descriptive, it becomes a fundamental puzzle why matter has got the same behavior everywhere in the universe as far as we can tell. If it's prescriptive, then that follows. But if they're descriptive, you end up with a puzzle. What is it which determines the properties of the matter and why is it the same everywhere? Okay, now we know that there are these two kinds of causation, impersonal, meaningless actions, algorithmic grinding away, and purposeful action related to ethics, aesthetics, telos, embodying values. The issue is which of these may plausibly be based in the other? Which can arise from the other? Where does the possibility spaces come from and what testing and data is relevant? Given suitable lowest level laws with restricted structure coupling constants, a hierarchy with effectively higher level laws can emerge. But what essentially underlies the lowest level laws on which the rest is based? Why do they exist with that form? And I'm going to just try to pursue a little bit these four possibilities. Pure chance, probability, necessity, or purpose. One possibility which some people believe in is pure chance is just the way it was. Now that's not a statement that it was probable. Probability doesn't enter. This is the statement, it just is what happened. This is just the way it was. There's no suggestion it was probable uh, outcome of some underlying dynamics. Now, this is a logically possible ultimate reason. If you say that this is your view, nobody can deny that this is a logically tight and concrete proposal. But it has no further explanatory power. If things are the way they are just because that's the way they are, this is denying there is any further possibility of explanation. So it's unsatisfactory to almost everybody. The scientists don't like it and religious people <laughs> don't like it. Primarily because we know that explanations do exist in the world. And so in some sense, it's sort of denying the fact that explanations do indeed exist. I do know one or two people who hold on to this view, but they're a rather exceptional minority. Furthermore, it's difficult to resist the argument that the outcome is so unlikely that pure chance simply is not credible as a reason. Not merely senses, qualia, emotions, but also complex theories such as Einstein's theory of relativity, quantum field theory have come into existence as extraordinarily complex theoretical construct. To suggest these can all arise without existence of any underlying cause or can come into existence out of pure chaos or nothingness without any further guiding structure seems to me simply absurd. Now that's a philosophical statement which you may, not may or may not agree with. 
If you have any cause or guiding structure, you don't have pure chaos or nothingness. Probability. Now, for the scientist, probability trumps a lack of any explanation. And I think and what we're seeing in cosmology through the idea of the multiverse is the attempt to say high probability is the basic explanation of what is happening in the universe. It's the basic reason we exist. But probability by itself is always an incomplete explanation because the probability is based in a set of physical laws and probabilistic laws. And so you simply have to say, fine, so that's high probability. Well, where, what underlies the laws which led to that probability? You can do complex calculations to obtain probabilities, but why are the assumed laws underlying these probabilistic calculations valid in the first place? In any case, probability is a good explanation for intermediate levels of explanation, but there's no evidence it applies in the context of ultimate causation. Indeed, as I've already mentioned, the very concept of probability is not applicable if there's only one object, the unique universe in existence. If there's only one universe, what do you apply your probability to? You haven't got anything to apply your probability to. You only have that if there is an ensemble that exists. But then you just step back one and say, fine, where did the ensemble come from? What underlay the ensemble? Was that probabilistic? On the other way, there's no way it can be proved to be true if it doesn't indeed apply via a multiverse context. Well, I'll, I'll be slightly, it's very difficult to prove it applies. The multiverse is an extractive explanatory proposal, but it's not testable physics in the usual sense. And of course, a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but I believe, as I've already made clear, yes, there's a web of explanation, but the case of the multiverse is a very, very different one because you're trying to explain what happens way out there on the basis of what happens within our visual horizon. Now, our visual horizon at the present time is 42 billion light years. That's three times the Hubble time because the universe has been expanding. If you're going to use the, the multiverse, and I'm going to, s you're going to try to say from this sphere of radius 42 billion light years, what happens, that's one three Hubble radii, you claim you can explain from the basis of what you know within that sphere, what happens 100 Hubble radii away, 1,000 Hubble radii away, 10 to the 100,000 Hubble radii away, you still haven't started on the road to infinity when you're 10 to the billion, 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 billion Hubble radii away because infinity is much, much bigger than any number you can ever, ever imagine. Okay, And the claim of the multiverse enthusiasts is we can explain what's happening all those distance away from this little sphere here. Well, little in cosmological terms. That is hubris of the most extreme kind. I used to write about this a while ago when I was talking about this. Imagine an ant in the Sahara Desert. He's on the top of his anthill and he looks around and he says, you know, the entire world is made of sand hills. Well, there's a horizon and he can't see beyond the horizon. He hasn't got a clue what lies beyond the horizon. And if you could prove that the laws of physics which lead to the multiverse are true, and you could test them, show they are true, then you would have a good reason for saying the multiverse has to exist, but those laws are highly contentious. They are extrapolations of known physics to an untestable domain. The claim that the multiverse follows from known physical laws is simply not true. They follow from extrapolated physical laws, and the extrapolation from the known laws to the extrapolated laws is untested and almost certainly indeed untestable. Necessity. Is this the only possible universe? Could it have not been any other way? Well, this is what we wanted to prove. This is what the aim of <laughs> fundamental physics was. But this aim has, of course, failed. And in fact, it's going the other direction. We've got the 10 to the 500 possibilities of the landscape of string theory instead of the one string theory which we were promised about 40 years ago. But in any case, supposing you could prove that it was inevitable, it actually would make the problem worse from my viewpoint because what you would have proven is that some theory based on, let's say, SU10 or E8 and variational principles and quantum field theory, you would have proven that that theory inevitably leads to the existence of life. 
That's actually an absolutely weird statement. If you think about it, it would be saying that somehow the pre-image of life is built into that group, those variational principles. In some sense, I think I prefer the multiverse explanation <laughs> to this one, because in the multiverse one, at least I can see there's a real argument there. There's all these different models out there, and things were different there, and then some of them had worked out, and some of them didn't. In this case, if there was only one conceivable possible theoretical physics model for physics, there's no reason I can see why that model would be such as to lead to that confluence of forces and strengths which would lead to the existence of life. Why should physics have the specific nature that leads to a particular high-level feature being necessary? What has to be explained includes where the very causal categories of chance, necessity, and purpose come from. Where do those categories come from? What underlies their existence? How do these concepts arise and have meaning? And what underlying ontological entities or causation do they represent? Why are they themselves necessary? You've got to follow it out. Where do these things come from? How can they even be relevant, as this whole discussion supposes, if there's no ontological referent that makes the dichotomy between them a meaningful issue? So the final one is purpose. Given the totally different quality of existence that emerges in human life from the underlying physics and the huge fine-tuning that's needed for this to occur, an underlying intention or purpose that this should be indeed be the case is a possible fundamental option. Basically the statement, it was meant to be that way. If this is the case, it's some higher set of purposive principles, the underlying telos or purpose, that is then the ultimate cause both of existence and its specific nature. This then relates, of course, to religious or spiritual views of the nature of reality, supported by a variety of evidence relevant to those domains. It's unlikely. Supposing that you were this being, you wanted to create a universe which would be such as to lead to life coming into existence. What would you have to do? You'd have to create a situation of physical structure where purpose can be meaningfully deployed so that ethical behavior is meaningful because the whole aim of the thing in that case would be to create a context where ethical behavior would be meaningful. This would require lower level laws that had the kind of impersonal regular behavior that allows reliable higher level behavior to emerge. In other words, Another way of saying this, ethics is only meaningful if there are reliable regularities which form the background within which ethical choices are made. So if you wanted to create a universe where ethics was meaningful, you would have to create laws of regularity which would provide the background for ethical choices to be made as well as for life to come into being. But you also need some kind of something to break the iron law of causation. So quantum uncertainty is a very, very interesting there. Quantum uncertainty breaks the iron determinism of physics and means that things are not determined specifically by the initial data I just mentioned. And so that's a very, very interesting combination of chance and necessity there. So if you are going to implement the idea that somehow something, some intention somehow created the universe in order that meaning could come into being in the universe, it entails both necessity and chance. Each of these kinds of causation, chance in the sense of probability, necessity, and purpose, does indeed occur in the world, but the only one, in my view, that seems to have the possibility of entailing the others is the purpose. We can talk about this, of course. This is, this is what this discussion is about. That's an underlying intention or purpose that this should indeed be the case is a possible fundamental option, offering the very ground out of which they themselves can come into existence. The question is, if you want to pursue this, you have to ask what kind of evidence is relevant. Now, we need data from the whole of life, not just physics and astronomy. And one of the things about this debate, the people from the physics and astronomy side talk about issues of fundamental meaning only taking into account data from physics and astronomy. Now, that's obviously not a sensible thing to do. If you want to try to talk about serious issues of meaning to do with life as we know it, to do with the meaning we all have in our lives, you must take those lives seriously as well as taking physics astronomy seriously. If you're dealing with ultimate meaning, what you must take into account as well as the physics and astronomy, which you must take into account, you must also take whatever take seriously whatever seems to give ultimate meaning in human life. And I've emphasized there is indeed purpose in the universe. I've emphasized this several times. 
Either purpose emerges out of nothing or is there from the start of the foundation. And I will come back to this. In my own view, the idea that you can have a totally meaningless situation out of which purpose emerges, in which there's this possibility space which allows meaning to come into existence, I don't think it makes sense to say that that can come out of a totally meaningless understratum. So, are the funda so what we can ask to try to take this a bit further, we know that there are these foundational laws of physics. Are there any foundational laws governing meaning and ethics? Can we point out to what we regard foundational laws which are the equivalent in the side of meaning and ethics of those laws of physics, the fundamental laws? Well, there has to be a foundation of consistency. One of the things we know about is the drive for life. One of them we know about in our lives is the need to belong. One of them is the search for purpose, the according of respect and dignity. These are all the kinds of things which we find in the world of meaning and ethics. Are any of these fundamental or are they all kind of derivative? Now there's of course the whole story of evolutionary development and we could go into that. But I'm asking which of these might be fundamental. And I have developed over the years with my friend Nancy Murphy the idea that there's one which is a deep and fundamental principle which I think is on a par in the, in the realm of ethics and meaning with the fundamental laws of physics and that is the deep principle of kenosis or self-sacrifice that underlies all of the other ones. Kenosis or self-emptying is a joyous attitude that values love and justice, is generous and creative in pursuing these aims. If needed, is willing to give up personal needs and to voluntary sacrifice on behalf of others. It is an attitude of letting go and it is paradoxical because it has a transformational nature in terms of the way it affects relationships between people. It has the possibility of changing the quality and the very meaning of the situation facing us. It is probably the only approach, for instance, that has the capacity to change an enemy into a friend. In the realm of meaning, this is highly paradoxical, but I think it is very, very well attested and it occurs all over the place. Kenosis is a theme in life at large. The mother and the child. Is the mother is willing to give up her life for the child. That is kenosis. The more difficult kenosis for the mother is letting go <laughs> of the child <laughs> as the child grows up. This letting go of your own needs is the foundation of community. Every community depends on the individuals be willing to give up their own needs in order for the greater good. It is the foundation of learning. If you want to learn something, you've got to be willing to give up what you already know in order that you can learn something new. It's the foundation of true artistic endeavor. In every really deep artistic endeavor, the sculptor, the painter, the musician starts off the, 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 the novelists, they start off with their ideas of what should exist and they start writing it that way and then the thing starts to take its own character and the deep art is that in which the creator then lets go of what they think should be and they respond to what is developing and respect what is there, thereby putting aside their own wishes for what should be and letting the thing have its own existence. And it's the basis of deep social action exemplified by Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, Happy Birthday Desmond, Ruby Bridges, <laughs> and the Amy Beale family. Giving up hate, seeing and responding to the humanity of the opponent, and it occurs in all the major religious faiths, and I can say that with a strong conviction. I was giving a talk like this in California one, and uh, after the talk a man came up to me, very, very excited, and he said, you spoke like a true Muslim. It's true in the Jewish faith, it's true in the religious faith, in, t in the Christian faith, interpreted properly. Gandhi, it's true in the Hindu faith, and so on. I believe that this idea of kenosis is a deep, paradoxical, foundational principle of the way that things work in the sphere of meaning, on a par with the way the fundamental laws of physics work and the other side, just a few quotes. An individual has not started living until he or she can rise above the narrow confines of his or her individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Every person must decide whether he or she will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? Richard Beller, 
The deepest truth I've discovered is that if one accepts the loss, if one gives up clinging to what is irretrievably gone, then the nothing which is left is not barren, but is enormously fruitful. Everything that one has lost comes flooding back out of the darkness, and one's relation to it is new, free, and unclinging. But more, the richness of the nothing contains far more. It is the all possible. It's the spring of freedom. That's an attempt to explain the paradoxical nature of giving up and then getting back out of that giving up more than you ever gave up. As there are theologians here, I will give you a religious quote on this. On the cross, our small self dies so that the true self, the God self, can emerge. On the cross, we give up the fantasy that we are in control, and the death of this fantasy is central to acceptance. The cross, above all, is a place of powerlessness. Here is the death of the ego, the death of the self that insists on being in charge, the self that is continually attempting to impose its own limited version of order and righteousness on the world. That is the great mystery at the heart of the Christian faith, at the heart of the person of Jesus, of Gandhi, of Martin Luther King Jr., the power of powerlessness. Emptiness is a key word describing the appearance of acceptance. Jesus on the cross emptied himself so that God could enter in. You may or may not agree with that religious language, but what I'm trying to say is if you want to talk about ultimate meaning in relation to the universe, this is the kind of territory you have to be prepared to go into. You cannot do it just on the basis of those scientific equations because those represent something of what is going on. They miss a huge amount of what is going on and they are not adequate to tackle the kinds of issues which relate to deep meaning. So one possibility is that this kind of thing is the core of being, the underlying ultimate purpose of everything relating to meaning and morality. One can argue that this purpose is, as identified by the spiritual tradition, is, uh, is um, true in all the major world religions. And in fact, Sir John Templeton wrote about this in a little book called Agape Love. If this was the underlying thing, a layered structure emerges. Purpose, this kind of purpose, underlies the impersonal laws that then underlie the emergence of purpose. And these two kinds of causation, intentional and impersonal, which undoubtedly both exist in the world around us, occur in an intertwined way, with chance events intervening and helping to lead to the richness of outcomes we see around us. So these are all possible. Neither science nor philosophy can give a certain answer. Metaphysical uncertainty remains. What is absolutely clear, if we agree that these are possible, you cannot prove scientifically, you cannot prove philosophically which of them is. It is a matter of faith which of these is the case. However, if one wants to relate the nature of existence to the deeper meaning of personal life, the last option has the most traction. The others in the end provide a more tentative relation to morality and meaning. But we do have experience that these do indeed exist, and we should recognize that in our theories of ultimate causation. So if everything has a cause, what causes the universe? I believe that emergence of totally new kinds of existence out of chaos out of the laws of physics cannot happen. In fact, my, my primary school motto <laughs> was ex nihilo nihil fit. Out of nothing, nothing can come into being. <laughs> and I think that that is very, very true. I believe that the kind we do know that morality exists. We do know good and evil exist. I believe that they can only come into existence if there's a possibility space which foreshadows their existence and which was in existence before the universe came into being just the same as the laws of physics and the laws of mathematics. Can meaning really emerge out of non-meaning? I don't believe so, but of course I could be totally wrong. At least it has to be foreshadowed in the possibility space. The data relates to the whole of life, not just physics and astronomy. I'll just give you one quote which I think conveys the kind of thing one needs to relate to as well as physics and astronomy. I say to myself as I watch the niece who's very beautiful, in her this bread is transmuted into melancholy grace, into modesty, into a gentleness without words. Sensing my gaze, she raised her eyes towards mine and seemed to smile, a mere breath on the delicate face of the waters, but an affecting vision. I sense the mysterious presence of the soul that is unique to this place. It fills me with peace and my mind with the words, this is the peace of silent realms. I have seen the shining light that is born of the wheat. To me, this conveys a quality of existence which does exist because you've just experienced it. How can that come into existence in the world, in the universe? That's the question. Well, I believe that this underlying idea of purpose does make sense. 
I think it makes more sense than the other ones. It should be emphasized that this is not a scientific conclusion, nor is the argument presented one that can be sustained on scientific grounds alone. It's a philosophically based conclusion. The issue considered here, the nature of ultimate causation, are not amenable to scientific resolution, precisely because they go beyond the domain where scientific experiments or observations can give a reliable answer. The argument is a philosophical or metaphysical one, based securely on current science, but also taking into account wider philosophical and human issues than can be handled by science per se. Any attempt to adequately tackle the fundamental issues considered should be of this nature. They must take this kind of existence seriously as well as the physics experiments and the astronomy experiments. If one wishes to deal purely in terms of scientific argumentation, the above will be beyond what one will consider as a legitimate argument. But if one takes that stand, if one takes the stand, I'm only going to deal with scientific issues and scientifically rigorous explanation, one should also refrain from making any statements about issues of ultimate causation. If you insist I'm only going to talk about scientific issues, then please don't talk about ultimate causation because you haven't got the ground from which you can adequately do so. So what's the nature of meaning? This core statement is the one which most religious people would agree with. You're confused about what has gone wrong and how to set it right. Then listen. This is what Yahweh asks of you and only this. To act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with your God. That is the kind of spirit which underlies the view that there is meaning or purpose underlying the whole of existence. And these are the kind of people for whom it refers to. And they are what one must take into account as well as astronomy and physics. Thank you. 